Yeah, that's okay. fine. Okay, there we go. All right, um, go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so today is functional analysis day. <clears throat> so in the morning, I'll be talking about non-Archimedean functional analysis, and then Peter in the afternoon will um, start discussing the Archimedean story, which is a good deal more complicated. So we'll actually continue the next day as well. Um, but so for non-Archimedean functional analysis, well, the category we'll be considering is solid QP modules, by which I can mean uh, oh, we take this condensed ring QP and take modules over it in solid abelian groups. Um, uh, so um, yeah, um, so how can we understand the structure of this category? Well, uh, if you take the first thing to understand is what the compact projective generators are going to look like. And for this, you should calculate the solid tensor. Ah, let me just say, whenever I write tensor product, from now on, I mean solid tensor product over Z. Um, and maybe the first thing to recall is- actually a full is, subcategory of solid to be in groups. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's what I was about to say. The, the first yeah. thing to mention is that <clears throat> QP is idempotent, which implies that uh, this is, um, uh, this is a full subcategory of solid abelian groups. And the solid tensor product over Z, uh, if, if M and N are uh, QP, solid QP modules, the solid tensor product over QP is the same as the solid tensor product over Z. Um, right. So you all have a lot of undecorated. Could you, could, you, hmm? could you remind us why that is? Oh, what this calculation, right? This tensor product calculation here? This yeah. QP tensor QP equals QP. Why that yeah, is? Yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's because QP is, is ZP bracket one over P. Um, and uh, the tensor product commutes with co-limits in both variables. So you can pull the one over P out uh, in both factors. So you're reduced to showing that ZP tensor uh, ZP is ZP. But, um, this you can prove by resolving ZP by copies of product, uh, products of copies of Z. By, uh, yeah, I guess one, well, one way of doing it at least is to write it as the quotient of the power series ring by T minus P. And then, you know, by definition, the solid tensor, pro well, by, by construction, more or less, the solid tensor product of infinite products of copies of Z, just the infinite products distribute over the solid tensor product. Um, so, uh, so you just do the, the little calculation there and see that you get this item potency. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking. I probably should have reviewed that. Um, yes, so QP is item potent. Um, and then, uh, uh, so we wanna figure out what the compact projective generators are. And we do that by doing this calculation. We take the compact projective generators in the solid uh, Z theory, which are these products of copies of Z. And then we just solid tensor product them with QP. Um, and this is again, uh, the thing for ZP. Uh, and then you pull out the one over P. Um, and again, here, this ZP can be resolved by two copies of products of copies of Z. And then the products of copies of Z always distribute over. And that implies then that the, the Z distributes over the ZP distributes over the product as well. So that gives product of copies of ZP uh, uh, bracket one over P. Um, so these are the uh, compact projective generators or the compact projectives uh, in solid QP modules. Um, and uh, we call these uh, Smith spaces, Piatic Smith spaces, following the, essentially the terminology of, I think, Akbarov in the, in the Archimedean context. Um, so, uh, I want to contrast this with Banach spaces. So, so first of all, so a p-adic Banach space, by the way, always has a basis. So it, it, it can be written like this, direct sum over I of Z, uh, and then take the P completion of that. So the inverse limit over the reductions mod P to the N, and then invert P. Um, so, or yeah, so, well, the big difference here is that you have this, uh, is that this part is compact. So in a Smith space, it's gotten by scaling out a compact subset. So you take a compact set and then you invert P to uh, add scalars. Um, 
Whereas in a Banach space, you get it's one of these Banach unit balls that you're scaling out. And in the infinite dimensional case, um, those Banach unit balls are not compact. Um, so yeah, if you reduce mod p, then you get an infinite direct sum. Um, so um, yeah. Uh, Right, so the Banach spaces, they have, uh, they're have they built from these unit balls, which are P, P completions of discrete things. And these uh, um, Smith spaces are built from uh, these um, uh, compact guys. Um, and I wanna discuss a little bit more about the, the difference between them. So there's actually, there are two relationships. Uh, So I should maybe recall also that since we know that compactly generated weak house door spaces embed fully faithfully in condensed sets, it follows that you know the category of piadic Banach spaces is a full subcategory of um, condensed QP modules, but in fact of solid QP modules, because this description and the fact that solid things are closed under all co-limits and limits implies that a Banach space is solid. Um, so we can, uh, from now on, whenever I talk about a Banach space, I'll always be implicitly viewing it as a solid QP module via this fully faithful embedding. Um, it, the homs are the same as you're used to. Um, there are two relationships between Smith spaces uh, and Banach spaces. Uh, so one is duality. So if you take um, hom, um, uh, from a Smith space uh, to QP. So just the QP linear dual, and I guess I should say internal HOM. Um, this is the same thing as the Banach space. Uh, why is that? Well, these are the compact projective generators. So they are the, the <laughs> solidification. The, mission, mission. Hmm? Sorry, what? Oh, I forgot mission. to complete. Yeah, thanks. Um, so these are the these are the compact projective generators. So they're the free things on extremely disconnected. So you can reduce to the case where this is a. So you can basically you're just calculating homes from an extremely disconnected to QP, and that is the Banach space of continuous functions on that profinite set. Um, so you have to check that the internal hom in the condensed world really is giving you the Banach space, but that's not very difficult, um, right? Uh, this is continuous functions on S with values in QP uh, if, uh, is the uh, solidification of the Z bracket S uh, tensor root QP, right? Um, uh, and on the, but on the other hand, if you take the Holmes of Banach spaces, um, Uh, then by the you know by the bounded mapping principle or whatever uh, because, because a, a continuous homomorphism of Banach spaces is bounded, um, this is going to be something inverted one over p, where that something is the integral analog. Uh, um, and um, uh, and this integral analog, now we're just doing a calculation on p completions of discrete things. So we can reduce mod p to the n and take the inverse limit again. And we're seeing, uh, and on the level of mod p to the n, we're seeing the infinite mapping out of an infinite direct sum. So that turns into an infinite product and you get this. Um, right. So here we use that uh, a continuous uh, homomorphism of Banach spaces. is bounded. Um, okay, um, so they're in duality with each other. Actually, I wanna make a, a, I don't think we've quite made this remark yet, but a big warning sign here. So um, the first duality, so uh, let's call this a, I don't know, a, a lowercase i, and I'll call this lowercase double i, or one and two, I don't know. Uh, so this this one where you cut uh, this one holds for Arham, uh, i.e., uh, the, the higher x, uh, and that's well, that's 
clear because this is a projective object, right? I said it was a compact projective object. Um, by the way, for the internal X, this may be not clear because uh, at least so in condensed abelian groups, recall that the compact projectors aren't closed under tensor product. And that means vanish. Uh, if you're a projective, your X vanish, but your internal X don't necessarily vanish. But once we move to the solid context, then the, we, we saw by calculation that the compact projectives, these infinite products of copies of Z are closed under tensor products. So then this kind of subtlety fortunately disappears. Um, so one holds for R, Hom. But two, and I'll, I'll say does not question mark, <laughs> and let me explain. Uh, uh, my guess, uh, it's probably independent of ZSC. Uh, so if you, let me explain. So if you actually want to calculate, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, actually maybe it'll be easier to explain. Um, yeah, I'll come back to this in a second. Once I mention the other relationship between Smith spaces and Banach spaces. Um, but yes, yeah, but you should just be aware that um, there are certain calculations mm -hmm. in here which you might I think. think we, do we know for a fact that in some models of ZFC it's wrong? No, I don't. I mean, I don't. Uh, oh. okay. Yeah. Um, actually, we, I pro maybe in this model that these guys produced, it's correct. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look into it again. Um, Right. Um, so the, there, I'm, we're going to give. I'm going to give you a lot of examples of things working out nicely, um, but you kind of uh, there are some things. It's impossible when you're setting up a framework for functional analysis mixed with homological algebra that every single calculation works out nicely. So here, there are just some things you don't want to do. You don't want to take R homs out of Banach spaces. You only want to take R homs out of Smith spaces, and that's just the way it is. Um, right. Uh, so that'll be easier to explain why when I um. Um, when I talk about the second relation, and the, the second relation is that um, a Banach space is a filtered colimit of Smith spaces. And dually, a Smith space uh, equals a filtered a limit of Banach spaces. So let me just explain this one here, which is the only one we're really going to use anyway. So this is, uh, I actually, I sort of already discussed this um, before, but I'll recall. So you can write this guy um, as the union over all functions from uh, the index set to the positive reals or non-negative reals, which uh, tend to zero, uh, meaning, um, you know, uh, if you want the value to be less than epsilon, you can always ensure the that for any epsilon, the value of f will be less than epsilon outside a finite subset of i. Um, uh, of um, uh, yeah, products of copies of uh, Q p. So you look at the subset of Q p. So uh, of norm less than or equal to i. And then less than or equal to f of i, I'm sorry, uh, bracket one over p. So up to, up to scale, you ask that the norm be bounded by this particular function. So note that this is a, a zp submodule of a qp. So it's just some, yeah, just, just some p to the valuation times qp, or valuation is, yeah. Um, but anyway, this is abstractly isomorphic to product over I of uh, ZP bracket one over P. Um, so it's this, uh, yeah. So note that this index uh, uh, this index set here uh, functions to the real numbers, which tend to zero. Um, this is uncountable. Uh, so it's an uncountable filtered inverse limit, ah, greater than L if not, uh, filtered co-limit. And this is what causes all the troubles when you're trying to calculate X out of Banach spaces. Because when you need to calculate an X out of Banach spaces, it's going to be, then you may do a dual and you have to understand a derived inverse limit over this, uh, this poset here, which is uncountable. And actually it's poset theoretic structure is known to be um, uh, independent of ZFC. Um, so various natural questions you can ask about this poset turn out to be independent of ZFC, like 
what is its copinality? So what is the largest cardinality of a copinal subset and so on? Um, so that, um, yeah, so that explains why um, Banach spaces are bad to map out of. But I also wanna make the point that um, from this perspective, it, it, it makes sense to, so, so I've, I've phrased everything symmetrically, right? The, they're, the Bonnach, you know, they're duals of each other and, um, and, Bonnach, and Bonnach is filtered column to Smith, Smith is filtered limit of Bonnach, but it makes sense to have Smith spaces be fundamental, I think, just based on this information because filtered colimits are nicely behaved. Um, so if you, if you understand Smith spaces, then you can get to Bonnach spaces, but filtered limits are kind of badly behaved in terms of their homological properties. They're derived, derived inverse limits are difficult. So it's hard to go from knowledge of Smith space, uh, Bonnach spaces to knowledge of Smith spaces. And similar, the calculation starting with the Smith space work, works out nicely in the derived world, but calculation starting with the Bonnach space does not. So this is one a priori motivation for why Smith spaces should be the fundamental thing as they, as they simply are in our, our theory. Um, okay, uh, right, so. There was a question in the chat. Uh, which one? The last one. Is there a nice description of the reflexive quasi-separated solid QP vectors? So that's a good question. Um, I kind of doubt it because the drive story is already so messed up. Um, Yeah, I think it gets pretty subtle pretty quickly. Um, yeah, if you start iterating like direct sums and products and of things and so on, you're gonna have, your head's gonna try to spin when you, your head's gonna start to spin when you try calculating these things. It's possible that somehow things work out nicely on the undrive level, um, but even then I wouldn't wanna do the calculations. Yeah, so basically I don't know. Um, Are these spaces reflexive? Uh, uh, that's possible. It's possible they are. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think I've actually, I think I've actually thought about that one before. I just can't remember what the answer was. Um, that one, it should be in principle possible to figure out. I just don't remember. Um, or no, I think, yeah, sorry. Uh, Right. Okay. Um, so that was um, a little bit about Smith spaces and Bonnach spaces. Now I want to make a note, which is that, oops. So, um, well, uh, Smith spaces are not an abelian subcategory. They're not closed under, they're closed under, uh, uh, Finite limits, but not finite co-limits. Um, so the uh, so here's the here, here's a little claim. Um, uh, the quotients of Smith spaces are the same thing as um, compact objects in this abelian category of solid QP modules. And it's also the same thing as uh, modules of the form uh, uh, C bracket one over P, uh, where C is an, uh, is an arbitrary now uh, uh, pro P abelian group. Um, and, um, and these form an abelian category. Uh, and a, a quotient of Smith space, I'll call these Q Smith spaces, quotient of Smith space uh, is Smith, uh, if and only if it's uh, quasi separated. So, so these are, these are um, non separated analogs of Smith spaces. Um, and a good example to keep in mind might be something like a uh, product over all n of z mod p to the nz uh, bracket one over p. So on the, on the sort of zp level, it is quasi-separated, but you have to be careful that quasi-separated things are not closed under filtered colimits. They're only closed under filtered colimits along injections. And so when you do something like this, um, because of the p torsion you've got there, you're gonna be in trouble. 
And now uh, you can actually check that this is not quasi separated. Um, right. Um, so how do you prove something like this? Well, um, first of all, Smith spaces are compact objects, and therefore so are quotients of Smith spaces. On the other hand, <clears throat> everything is presented by a direct sum of Smith spaces. And then for maps between direct sums, since Smith spaces are compact, you can, uh, you can sort of pull in the, uh, you can write it as a union, a filtered union of, uh, you know, if the co-kernel of a map between direct sums of Smith spaces will be a filtered union of co-kernels of maps between Smith spaces. So these guys are compact objects and there are enough of them, meaning they generate the category under filtered co-limits. Therefore, by general category theory, the compact objects will be exactly the retracts of quotients of Smith spaces. Um, so then if we can check that this is an abelian category, then, well, it'll be closed under retracts in particular. Um, well, I guess maybe it might even be a priori pair. No, it's not a priori pair, it's closed under quotients. But anyway, so this uh, um, implication will follow if we can see that quotients of Smith spaces are closed under uh, retracts. Um, uh, on the other hand, yeah, no, sorry, then the, actually the, the equivalence will follow. The argument I gave establishes the equivalence. Um, on the other hand, if you have a quotient of Smith spaces, then it's a map from product of ZP one over P to product of ZP one over P. Um, and uh, these are, you know, it'll be one over, uh, you know, set a map from a compact, the, the, if you look at the generating compact, the product of ZPs, it'll have to map inside some compact level of the, the target. And so the, the co-kernel will be one over P of the co-kernel of the map on the level of product of ZPs. So that will be, that will give you this C here as in three. Um, but then for the same reason, you can just check that this here is an abelian subcategory by exactly the same argument with looking at what happens on the compacts. Um, and then that will check, since I just said that this was in there and you can write everything in here. Yeah, you can write everything in here as a, you can resolve any such guy in terms of products of copies of ZP. Um, and that will prove that this is the same as this. And then this is an abelian category. So it ends up proving everything. Um, okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't write all that down. I just kind of said it in words, but um, yeah, I, maybe I give some indication of how you make these kinds of arguments. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so that's a, so that's a nice abelian subcategory you have. Um, but as usual, with a, when you want abelian subcategory, you have to have these non-quasi separated things. So there is an analog uh, uh, for Banach spaces as well. Uh, so there's quotient of Banach spaces, um, which is the same thing as, um, uh, so uh, those uh, uh, M in solid Q, QP, such that if you take the underlying discrete thing, uh, oh no, sorry, um, sorry, uh, equals uh, M bracket one over P, where uh, M in solid ZP uh, is such that uh, if you take the underlying discrete thing uh, mapping to M, uh, um, uh, so, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this induces, uh, uh, so if you take pi naught of M discrete uh, P completed, uh, then that's the same thing as M. Yeah, so if you, so we have these basic Banach spaces, which were direct sums of copies of ZP, say, and then P complete that, and then invert P. You can generalize that by, instead of taking a direct, a direct sum of copies of ZP, taking some arbitrary ZP module, which is not necessarily flat, um, and then P complete that, but you have to derive P complete it, sorry. Uh, if you want to get an abelian category, you have to derive P complete it. Um, that might actually introduce something in pi one, and then you have, so you have to take pi naught. But then you ask that this be m, um, uh, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that was just to mention there. There is that analog there, and it's kind of this is equivalent to uh, yeah. In terms of equivalence of categories, this is equivalent to um, the usual category of derived p-complete abelian groups. Oops. Uh, 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 up to isogeny. So 
yeah, there's this notion of isogeny category where you say anything killed by um, some finite power of P has to die. Huh? Oh, you're, oh yeah, there's a discussion going on in the chat. Um, yeah, so you have this familiar category of derived P-complete abelian groups, this mild non-separated generalization of the of P-complete abelian groups. Um, and then there's the isogeny category. So you neglect torsion in some way. And then this gives you um, quasi banach spaces. Right. Um, yeah, you could, could do something analogous here. Say that you, uh, you take um, pro-P abelian groups and take its isogeny category, and that gives the quotients of Smith spaces. Okay, so those were some, um, ah, so no, wait, maybe I make a general remark about uh, quasi-separated things. So um, quasi-separated uh, solid QP uh, is the same thing as uh, unions um, of compact of Smith spaces. Um, and all such are flat. And the collection of them is closed under tensor product. So this is a very convenient claim because if you have your classical functional analytic objects, they're all Hausdorff, um, like maybe some Fourche space or something, you can put them in the solid world, they will be quasi separated and now you know that uh, you know drive tensor products, drive solid tensor products, and undrive solid tensor products are going to be the same. They're still going to be concentrated in degree zero. They're still going to be quasi separated. So basically, some kind of familiar Hausdorff thing. So nothing crazy is going on. Um, and this is um, not so difficult to prove. I mean, the point is. Uh, so the point is. Uh, um, well, we know that any anything is a union of its. Uh, if we take some quasi, well, first of all, a union of Smith spaces means a filtered column of Smith spaces along inclusions. So it's quasi separated because it's a, a column of quasi separated things along inclusions. Um, so that one direction is clear. But then if you have something quasi separated, it's going to be the union of the images of the maps from Smith spaces. Um, but, uh, sorry, no. so you take the maps from the Smith spaces, but then on the generating compacts, uh, the image inside will have to be compact because uh, M is quasi separated. Um, but on the other hand, it'll be torsion free. And then it's a fact you have to use that a pro P group C, which is P torsion free, is automatically a, a product of copies of ZP and therefore generates a Smith space. So the image of a map from a Smith space to a quasi separated is also a Smith space. Um, okay. Uh, right. Uh, so that's kind of nice and convenient. Um, uh, oh yeah, why are they flat? I forgot to mention that. Actually, this was something I already discussed last time. Um, it's a fight. So since it's a filtered co-limit of Smith spaces, in fact, along inclusions, um, it suffices to see that a Smith space is flat. Um, but uh, but um, uh, and then uh, so if you have a Smith, but if you have a Smith space. Um, since everything is a filtered column of compact objects, it's enough to test uh, for the drive tensor product uh, with one of these uh, C bracket one over P's. Um, this is again going to be product of ZP drive tensor product C uh, one over P. And then again, using a two term resolution, you can see that the tensor product with C is always going to commute with this infinite product um, on, on the derived level. Um, so then this will be product of C bracket one over P. And then you just note that this still lives in degree zero. Um, ah, after all, I think I'm just explaining it, yeah? Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. He asked it when you just, uh, before right, you okay. start. That's always a good sign, you know? <laughs> um, but, okay. but in, in solid Z, the same argument does not work, right? You said that. That's right. In solid Z, the same argument doesn't work because it's hard to control quotients of, of maps between products of copies of Z. So mm -hmm. That's the difference here. Okay. Do we know the Tor dimension of solid QP? Yes, it's, uh, it's one, right? So um, uh, I just said that the... Um, um, 
Well, yeah. So every every C bracket one over P can actually actually admits a two term resolution by Smith spaces um, by resolving C in terms. Of, no, that's quite all right, Michelle. Yeah, resolving C in terms of products of copies of ZP. Um, so yeah, the flat dimension. Yeah, uh, Tor is only uh, yeah Tor I in solid QP uh, equals zero for I greater than one. That's that's also quite nice. So tensor products are very very tame in this context. So arhams are kind of a mess in general because you have these huge co-limits, yeah. And then you take an arham out of it and you get a huge inverse limit, which is difficult to control. But um, tensor products are just co-limits of co-limits, you know, tensor co-limits to co-limits. Co so they're very well behaved. Um, the next thing I want to aim for uh, um, is that so if you take a Frechet space. Uh, so I'll recall that, so, well, the classical definition of a Frechet space is a, yeah, some kind of a topological QP vector space, which is, whose topology is given by a countable family of semi-norms, okay? Um, and it has to be complete, yeah, complete, and its topology is given by a countable family of semi-norms. But that's just the same thing as, you can take each individual semi-norm and complete with respect to that, and then you'll get a Bonhoeff space. And then the completeness of your Frechet space is saying then that your Frechet space is the inverse limit of these Bonhoeff spaces. Um, uh, but you have to remember that uh, along, it's always along dense transition maps because the, the Bonhoeff spaces were gotten by completing. So this is an equivalent characterization of Frechet spaces, which uh, will be more convenient for us because it's already expressed in kind of categorical terms. So. V is an inverse limit of Bonhoeff spaces under uh, dense transition maps. So anyway, the aim is going to be that, so we can put these in the solid world. Um, so then this, the, the claim will be that the solid tensor product um, is just the, uh, the so-called projective tensor product. Um, And what is the projective tensor product? This is the thing that, um, well, uh, if we have two presentations like this, um, WM maybe I should say, uh, then this thing is uh, the inverse limit over N and N of uh, VN projective tensor product WM. And this is the, uh, the only reasonable tensor product of Bonhoeff spaces. So if, for example, on the free guys, uh, 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 tensor uh, this is just you do you just uh, distribute with respect to the index sets. Um, yes. Limit in condensed abelian groups. Yes, limit in topological vector spaces in the classical language, but that turns into a limit in condensed abelian groups. Um, right. Um, so this is kind of an interesting claim, I thought, or it's, it's, it was not obvious to me that this should be true um, because, uh, I mean, the solid tensor product, by definition, it commutes with co-limits, right? And um, on something like the compact projective objects, it feels like, at least in solid Z modules, it commutes with some limits as well. Like the products of copies of Z, but these Bonhoeff spaces are very far from the compact projective generators. Um, uh, but actually, that somehow turns out to help us in the end in a strange way. Um, so uh, yeah, for example, I don't think it's true that the uh, actually that actually for the compact projective solid QP modules that the tensor product is going to commute with the uh, countable products. So. Um, yeah, anyway, that, that's, a, that's a difference between QP and ZP. We'll, we'll come to more differences like that in a second. But, um, but the, to prove this, we're going to go through, well, first. I don't hear you anymore, Dustin. Are you still there?
Yes. Um, ah, oh, sorry. I, somehow everything just closed for some reason. I don't know what happened. Did anyone else get affected or was it just me? It's you, I think. It oh, seems it's you. Okay, I have to go. I have to get back on in my. Sorry, guys. I have to get back on on my. Um, that was really strange. Um, on my what's it called here? Ah, start broadcast. Okay, on my iPad. Only the oh, you have to make my iPad host again. Yeah. So well, so first we're gonna check that it's true on the on the um, Banach spaces. So we have to calculate the solid tensor product of of two Banach spaces. I guess I should take J. And how do you do this? Well, you write them, you express them as in terms of Smith spaces, yeah, as co-limits of Smith spaces. And I already said how to do this. Remember, this was some union over all functions from I to R greater than or equal to zero, tending to zero. Uh, and similarly, this would be some union over function J, or G from J to R greater than or equal to zero. And then there are these um, compact projectors where you bound each individual entry in norm by up to, up to overall scalar. You bound it in a norm by f of i or g of j, um, and then you need to see that that matches up when you when you take the tensor product there. You just collect these unions together and tensor product the Smith spaces, and you have to check that that gives you what uh, the thing for i cross j, and you see that what you need is that uh, any function uh, h from i cross j to r greater than or equal to zero tending to uh, uh, to zero is uh, dominated by uh, by some uh, function f cross g uh, where that means uh, you take f of i times f of, uh, some times g of j um, and for this you can take uh, you can take f of i to be the square root of the maximum uh, over j of uh, h of i j and you can take g of j to be uh, square root of the maximum over i of h of i j. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave it to you to, to check that this just works. Um, yeah, so, so this will mean that, yeah, that the calculation works out. So that's one, that's a nice thing. So it's true for Banach spaces. Um, and then the next thing I want to uh, check is that it's true if, uh, well, I'll just write down what I want. So if you take a countable product of copies of QP and you solid tensor product it with another countable product of copies of QP, uh, then this is, uh, then you can pull that in. Um, and again, this is something that is not quite obvious, but so you have to actually just write down and check. Well, the, so there's the analogous, uh, you can write this also as a union of Smith spaces, also a union over functions, but now arbitrary functions. So no condition that it tends to zero um, of a, a product over n and n qp less than or equal to uh, f of n and then one over p. Maybe it's worth remarking that here it's really critical that the index set is countable. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So the previous one for Banner spaces, any index set was good. Here it yeah. has to be countable. Yeah, absolutely. So in fact, yeah, I'm going to use an ordering of um well, Lars, in the proof you'll see. Uh I'm going to use an ordering on I'm going to use the fact that I have an ordering on my index set. Well, you know, I mean I'm I'm gonna use the <laughs> I mean, use that it's indexed by the natural numbers. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, right. So this is a union over arbitrary functions. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, I, I don't know. I, um, yeah, this is a union over arbitrary functions, and this will also be a union over arbitrary functions g. Um, and then you want when you tensor these basic things together and collect the unions together, somehow you cover arbitrary functions. Uh, so we need that an arbitrary function h from n cross n to r greater than or equal to zero is dominated uh, by some, uh, again, some f cross g, where f and g are arbitrary, well, where f and, yeah, by some 
And now we take uh, f of n equals the maximum of, well, I think I might need to throw in one there, and then the maximum overall i j less than or equal to n of h of i j. Uh, and then g of, yeah, and maybe I, I, maybe I can even take g of n to be the same thing. Um, yeah, so you have, you're using that, yeah, I don't know. This, I'm using that it's the natural numbers here. Um, so that it's, yeah. I'm using that n cross n has the same cardinality as n, and I don't know, it's indexed by some, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't exactly want, I, I don't exactly know how to say. The thing with the cardinality is always true. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, but there's something with the linear ordering that I'm using where it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a, yeah, prefixes are finite, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, something like this. Um, okay, so that's a little interesting. So that's also a special case of the claim because the infinite product of copies of QP is it's, it's a special kind of inverse limit of finite dimensional QP vector spaces um, along surjective transition maps. And that is a, a certain case of a Fréché space. Um, okay. Um, to, so, uh, so now we'll also need uh, uh, this claim. If you have a Banach space, and you tensor it with an infinite product of copies of uh, QP, uh, then you can pull in, uh, pull it through there. Um, this is the most subtle. I wrote an argument, so a priori you could prove it the same way, right? Where you write this as a union of the, this is its union, this is its union, and then you try to write this as a union of Smith spaces and then just match everything up. I wrote an argument like that once and it was uh, surprisingly subtle to get the combinatorics uh, to work out. I had to think about it for actually a couple of days to get it right. Maybe that's just me. Um, uh, but uh, but I'll, I'll actually give a different, more clever argument later in the, um, later in the talk once we've, once we've introduced a little more technology. Um, but why is it so subtle? So for example, uh, so I'll, I'll give you another warning. Uh, this fails on the integral level. Uh, what do I mean by that? So, uh, so the integral analog of a Banach space is just like p completion of uh, direct sum of copies of zp, and you could ask what happens when you solid tensor product that with um, uh, uh, an infinite product of copies of zp. Um, this is not the same thing as an infinite product of copies of ZP. Um, so you can see this is not the same by uh, reduce mod P. Uh, um, so then you get a direct sum of copies of FP, tensor product of copies of FP. And that's just, I mean, you know, the solid tensor product commutes with co-elements in both variables. So you just pull that direct sum out on the outside and you don't put it on the inside. Uh, that, that gives you something different. Um, so it's really quite subtle that some of this, uh, I don't know, it's something to do with the fact that you, some of infinite products of copies of QP behaves really, really differently from infinite products of copies of ZP. Um, this is a little bit surprising that it behaves nicer in, in, in many ways. Um, okay, so we'll give an argument um, in a second. So I'll give an argument to, uh, Uh, using the concept of uh, nuclearity. Um, which is something that we define that's motivated by, um, uh, uh, no, that's already periodically complete one. So, um, yeah, this is something we define that's motivated by a Grotendieck's concept of nuclear topological vector spaces. You won't need to know what that is, but um, and, but then it turned out to take on, and we, we were motivated by some uh, desire to get some good K theory actually, but then uh, it kind of took on a life of its own and proved to be a very nice um, tool for linear algebra. 
um, in the solid context. Uh, uh, so, um, right. So how do I want to introduce this? So, I, so let me recall that there's a difference between um, Smith spaces and Banach spaces. However, in some cases, the distinction doesn't matter. So, uh, um, well, say we have a Smith space. Uh, uh, um, can also be given uh, a Banach topology. I'll put that in quotation marks. So let's write, uh, we can write VB for the Bonachification of, of V. Well, we could just take the same description, but um, you know, treat this as a, uh, treat this as a discrete thing and then re-piatically complete it. So the difference will be, uh, so this is these, so this product of copies of ZP and this uh, P completion of the discrete version of the product of copies of ZP, they're both gonna be P complete. So they're, they're the limits of their reductions, but for the mod P reduction here, you have an infinite product of copies of FP, which is compact, but here you have an infinite product of copies of FP viewed as a discrete FP module. So it's discrete. Um, so uh, yeah, so, uh, in fact, and we'll see this later. Well, we'll see one reason why later. Uh, so this is a functor, uh, is natural in V. Uh, and then we have a map, uh, V bana, natural map, which is in fact a, a monomorphism. So it's an inclusion. So you can think for every Smith space, it's bana topology is a, is a finer topology. Yeah, it's closer to being discrete. Um, and then, um, uh, so then for, an R, for another Smith space W, uh, you can ask about, so, uh, and, and the map here, you can ask, uh, when does it factor? Uh, through uh, V Bana. Um, and there's many different ways to phrase the answer. Well, um, one is that a F, uh, yeah. F is dual to uh, a so-called compact operator um, on the level of Banach spaces. Um, I won't get into this because this is not going to be so important to us, but if you've heard of it in functional analysis, the comp concept of a compact operator between Banach spaces, then um, the maps factoring through V Banach will simply be dual to that concept. So for a Banach space, it's essentially obvious from the definition that a map of Banach spaces is a compact operator, if and only if it factors through a Smith space. And then this is kind of, when you dualize, you get this, uh, this claim here. Um, but the uh, characterization that I'm gonna be interested in is that uh, if and only if F is a trace class. Um, and, uh, what does this mean? Uh, so, uh, well, um, so, uh, uh, so definition, a trace class map uh, from any W to any V um, is a map coming from uh, some element of So the dual of V uh, sorry, the dual of uh, um, the dual of W tensor V, and then I should evaluate on the base point to get an honest map um, uh, via the natural contraction map uh, from internal HOM W Q P. Uh, tensor V um, uh, to HOM uh, WV. 
and then you evaluate on the base point and you get a map from the base point here to the just the set of maps from w to v um, so the main motivation for this terminology is that if v were equal to v I mean, if w were equal to v right um, then this would be the, the the endomorphisms coming from here would be exactly the things that we can uh, define a, a trace on um, namely oh, sorry yeah um, this is not the contraction it's just the natural map but if v were equal to w then we'd also have the evaluation pairing uh, going to qp which would show that if you if you lift to uh, if you lift your home morphism to this uh, set here uh, then then you get to define the trace by by contraction um, so that's why it's called the trace class map um, so uh, here's a reformulation Uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, uh, no, sorry. Um, uh, right. All right. So, uh, so let me yeah let me make a reformulation. Um, so let's let V be a solid QP module, uh, and then define another solid define a condensed QP module. Uh, uh, by uh, uh, let's call it uh, V trace uh, by uh, V trace on an extremely disconnected set S um, will be uh, home from S to QP or continue, I guess, continuous functions from, uh, I should, I should change that to continuous functions. Uh, continuous functions from S to QP, um, tensor would be uh, evaluated at the base point or about, I'm sorry, at the point, not the base point, it's just the point. Um, okay. Um, then uh, uh, there is a natural map uh, from VTR to V uh, and uh, a trace and for, for W a compact projective, for W a Smith space, uh, a trace class map Uh, from W to V uh, is the same as a, a map factoring through V uh, T R. Okay, so this is just a reformulation, but it's nice to package it in this uh, this functor. So this uh, this is a functor uh, uh, from solid Q P. Uh, a priori to condense QP, but you can actually show that the um, this V TR is also a solid QP module. Actually, that, you can prove it for completely formal reasons. There's a weird little trick. Um, so we know that to specify a condensed thing, it's enough to specify it on the extremely disconnected as long as it sends disjoint unions to products. Similarly, to specify a solid thing, it's enough to specify it on compact projectives um, as long as it's an additive functor. So you could define a solid analog of this by saying VTR on a compact projective is the same as the internal HOM from that compact projective to QP tensor V evaluated at the base point. And then that would, for these formal reasons, define a solid thing. But then you can just check that its underlying condensed thing is the same as this because the, yeah. Because um, when you evaluate, yeah. When you evaluate on the free thing on an extremely disconnected, that is a compact projective. But on the other hand, it, it turns into continuous functions. So that's very weird. Um, but anyway, so then the refined version of the claim uh, that I was making characterizing maps factoring through the Banach space version of the Smith space is that um, uh, so um, if, uh, if V is a Smith space, uh, imply then this VTR uh, is the same thing as V Banach. 
uh, sorry, I should also say there's a, there's also a natural transformation. So VTR always maps to V. So this is this with their maps to V. So that's the kind of nice uh, refined functorial version of the claim that trace class maps are the things that uh, factor through a Banach space. Um, so how do we prove this? Well, actually, I mean, it's, it's the same old story. We have to do a calculation of a solid tensor product if we want to understand what VTR of S is. So, um, well, continuous functions on S with values in QP tensor a Smith space, which might as well be product of copies of ZP uh, and then one over P. Um, so again, we can pull out the one over P continuous functions SQP is the same as continuous functions SZP bracket one over P. Uh, and again, no, a priori here, we'd have to write this as a union of Smith spaces uh, in the, in this, this is a Banach, well, the unit ball in a Banach space, we'd have to write it as a union of products of copies of ZP and do our calculation. But here we'll, we'll, We'll use the fact, uh, let's use the fact, uh, the very convenient fact uh, that um, solid tensor product, uh, that P complete guys are closed under solid tensor product. So these two terms here, CSZP and product of copies of ZP, they're both P complete. So the tensor product will also be P complete. So it can be recovered from its mod P to the N reductions just by an inverse limit. So this is inverse limit over N of, and then we do the mod P to the N analog. So continuous functions on S with values in Z mod P to the N, uh, tensor over Z mod P to the N, uh, product of copies of Z mod P to the N. And then of course, at the end, we have to invert P. Um, and now what about this calculation? Well, now the nice thing is that this guy is discrete. Um, so we're taking, ah, sorry, I forgot to evaluate at the base point. Yeah, of course, we also have to, well, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be evaluating at the base point at the end as well, right? We're interested in this value of this tensor product on the base point. But now, okay, the inverting P commutes with evaluating on the base point. Um, inverse limits commutes with evaluating on the base point. Um, uh, so then we're interested in this tensor product evaluated on the base point. But since this is discrete, this solid tensor product is just a glorified direct sum. Yeah, it's just, I mean, this is gonna be a free Z mod P to the N Z module. Um, and then that commutes with evaluating on the base point. And the upshot is that this is the inverse limit over N of continuous functions on S Z P N tensor. Uh, you can make the ca calculation in the discrete world and it, it doesn't change. So we just make this discrete and it'll have the same evaluation on the base point um, and then one over P. And this is another way of describing um, continuous functions on S with values in product of ZP uh, made discrete, piadically completed uh, values in one over P, uh, which is continuous functions from S to the Banach space version of V. Um, okay, so <laughs> um, I think I'm uh, out of time. So. These were these are some preliminary. Let me explain where we're going. These are some preliminary calculations um, for Smith spaces, will let, which will let us get a handle on. I haven't defined nuclear modules yet, but these will be the key things that let us uh, figure out exactly what the nuclear modules is are in the solid case. And then I'll explain why why we care about that and some good things this concept of nuclearity does for you. Okay, thank you, Dustin. <laughs>